airmail is perhaps one of the most boring topics one can talk about, just about as interesting as the history of grass. But it's a shame that not a lot of people have talked about it, since airmail was an essential part of America's aviation history. The physical mail, of course, didn't change anything, but the economics and politics behind flying them around the country did. It created a whole bunch of airlines, which fattened up and reshaped due to subsidies, culminating in a massive scandal known as the airmail scandal, which resulted in another reshaping of the industry. The end result of it all was the creation of what would one day become some of the largest airline and airplane companies in the world. That's why I decided to make a video about it, and has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the topic is a low-hanging fruit where I can spam public domain videos to save on my animation budget. So let's get started. While some would argue about the origin of it all, true airmail service began with the government post office department in 1918. The initial rate was 24 cents per ounce of mail, or equivalent to $3.84 per pound. But don't worry, there are plenty of people willing to pay a fortune to be the train. As more and more people demanded the service, the airmail network expanded, soon crisscrossing the whole country. But as the network expanded, the government wanted to hand the operations over to private contractors who can fly the mail for the government. Plus, the US aviation industry was looking a bit quaint compared to their neighbors across the pond. They might as well use the airmail contracts as a way to jumpstart the country's airline industry. So they got down to work and drafted out rules and contracts for private airlines to start taking over the airmail service. After it was all said and done, Congress passed it as the Airmail Act of 1925, setting the rules for airlines to follow if they so wished to get a government airmail contract. They also set the maximum bidding price and method of payment for the contracted airlines. $3 per pound of mail for 1,000 miles flown. That's a pretty sweet deal, especially since it pays better than carrying other stuff, like, say, actual passengers. Of course, that was the whole point. The government hoped to grow airlines by dumping loads of cash into them. By the way, the postage rate actually goes for only about $1 per pound, so essentially the government was subsidizing airlines to fly the mail, once again with the hope to grow them. The result? Airlines flocked to the government for contracts. If you don't have an airline, make one. No surprise, the largest three airlines of the US today all have their origins dating back to 1925 and 1926. In fact, most of the early contracts were taken up by those who just started an airline. Airlines began transporting mail across the country, flourishing in the lucrative contracts generated from a growing economy of the 1920s and totally not because they're boosting profits by filling planes with random junk. You see, subsidizing airmail by weight just invites people to abuse the system. Like, why just carry lightweight mail when you can boost your profits by throwing in a 100 pound iron stove? No surprise the rules were changed. First in 1928, and then again in 1929. Airmail can now only pay for a maximum of $1 per pound for 1,000 miles, or $2 per mile whichever is less. So that took care of the heavy junk mail, but now they want to lower the price even further. Doing this will be difficult because there were dozens of small airlines flying small planes with small amounts of mail at a time. Like imagine, how efficient a company like Amazon would be if they delivered by dozens of mopeds instead of just one van. It won't. Same goes for planes. It's more efficient to transport mail and big planes that are filled to the brim than smaller ones. To do this, airlines will need to merge so they can afford to fly bigger planes. So the government began pressuring airlines to merge, taking place in a series of meetings that will be non-foreshadowingly named the Spoils Conferences. This was also written in black and white of the latest edition of the Airmail Act in 1930. Not only were the rates reduced even further, it was also written that airlines must also have owned and operated an air transport service on a fixed daily schedule over a distance of not less than 250 miles and for a period of not less than six months prior to the advertisement for bids. In other words, sorry small airlines, you're screwed. So the smaller companies were left out 
and gave up all their hopes for airmail contracts. Just kidding, they just merged into some giant companies. Companies such as UATC, TAT, and AVCO. By the way, these companies weren't just airlines. They were also doing everything from making airplane parts, engines, and the planes themselves. Something known as vertical integration. Companies that were not big enough lost out. But that's okay, right? This is what the government was looking for after all. Plus the industry was already in the process of doing so, even before the new rules were in place. It all seemed to work out. The three companies were doing well for themselves, especially during a time when the economy was in a depression and the average cost of airmail dropped from $1.10 per mile in 1929 to just 54 cents per mile in 1933. The people were happy and the airlines were happy unless you were one of the small ones who lost out, in which you most likely protested. Yeah, it wasn't long before that happened. The question about whether these changes were fair were already around, but it wasn't until 1934 when somebody finally did something about it. The government, who began investigating the issue. It just so happened that the investigation started right after a new administration and Congress was in town, who also happened to not get along with the previous administration in Congress who wrote the Airmail Act in 1930 and who was totally not investigating the issue for political expedience. Whatever the reason was, the investigation found that yes indeed there was evidence of fraud and collusion between the airlines and the previous administration that once again the new administration in Congress did not get along with. Uh-oh, looks like there's a scandal over airmail. Let's call it the airmail scandal. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, since some shenanigans happened during the airmail contract and bidding process, one of the ways to fix it would be to cancel all the contracts. Wait, doesn't that seem a bit severe for a punishment? Well, apparently not, because that's exactly what happened. On February 9th of 1934, the president signed an executive order to cancel the contracts within 10 days, impacting 26 routes and 12 airlines. And who's going to be flying all those piles of undelivered mail left behind by the airlines? Well, why not the military? They've done it before with far more primitive planes. The assumption was, if they're made for battle, they're good enough for parcel. So that's what happened. The airmail service was given to the Army Air Corps. They tightened up their bootstraps, loaded up their warplanes, and recruited over 200 of their pilots to carry airmail. Flying mostly during the night, they flew across the country with their precious cargo, transferring and delivering mail through all sorts of weather, and killed about 5% of the pilots. You see, the military pilots were trained for daytime combat maneuvers, not trying to fly in an accurate straight line during the dead of night during a snowstorm. Same goes for their equipment. They're designed for battle, not blizzards. Not only did they have to cut back over 30% of the original airmail routes, over the course of six months, the Army Air Corps were involved in 66 accidents, resulting in 13 fatalities, shocking the public about how crappy their military appeared and directing blame to the administration. Needless to say, the government went back to the commercial airlines. So, new contracts were drafted up to be sent out for bidding. But not before some new rules were set this time around. First, the contract payment was limited to 40 cents per mile, making it much harder, if not impossible, to make money just from airmail. Second, screw vertical integration. Companies like UATC, TAT, and AFCO were deemed to be too big and powerful and can no longer exist. To this day, if you want to start a business to make aircraft engines, your own planes, or your own airline, tough luck, you can only do one or you'll need to move to your crane. Same goes for all three giants, all popping into a whole bunch of companies. Third, any airline that won contracts from the spoils conferences cannot get new contracts for five years. That's a pretty big bummer, since it ruled out pretty much all the big airlines of the day. So naturally, they gave up their endeavors and their hopes for airmail contracts. Just kidding, they just renamed themselves and got them back. In any case, 
the newest set of rules changed the way the industry operated. With a bid price reduction, airmail was no longer a lucrative business. That means airlines needed to focus on other sources of revenue, like flying actual passengers. The emphasis of carrying people also accelerated the development of new larger planes. And despite the setback of breaking up aircraft manufacturers, companies like Boeing and United Technologies survive to this day. But perhaps the most important change overall was what a decade of airmail contracts had done. It helped jumpstart airlines across the country, it set rules and regulations that we still adhere by, and it created an airline industry that we totally all know and love today. Oh yeah, it turns out that some of the airlines claim for damages after all of this, in which the government found that while the contracts were cancelled legally in 1934, they found no evidence of fraud, collusion, or any conspiracies between the airlines and the government. So much for that. 